Um, other than the usual route of, of building your company, of bootstrapping your company by getting 100,000, making it 200, and so on, if you want to do something big or bigger, I would say, uh, especially in the regulated world, if you want to build a new payments platform or a new insurance company or a bank, you have to start with a much bigger base. And you also, you, you in fact, do things in reverse. First, you get the money, and then you have to start to build your own company. Yes, you can simulate that, you can do business planning until the cows come home, but at the end of the day, business building or company building starts the day after you got the money. So from our perspective, um, we had sort of three mini challenges uh, after we sort of got our commitment from our investors. The first one is to get licensed. Um, again, this is something which doesn't apply to any company, it applies only to regulated companies, whether it's a bank or an insurance company. And getting that license thing, so getting that license um, sorted out, especially in the world we live right now where insurance companies and banks fail, it's tougher. So the regulars get stricter, bureaucracy even tougher. And f the funny, th funny thing is that when you actually go to the Bank of Greece or to the Ministry of Finance and your meeting is 10 minutes before they meet the IMF or you know, the Troika, you have to put things in perspective. We had some sort of really funny moments where we would come out of the Bank of Greece and the, ne the next people would go in was for an expiring bond of like a couple of billion. So people don't really <laughs> care about your, uh, your issues. Now, the second thing is people. We cannot stress that enough. Um, sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's, I don't know, karma, whatever it is. You have to talk to hundreds of people. You have to kiss many, pr many frogs to get to the prince. But you have to get good people behind you, especially in the core functions of your company. For us, it was technology. We have an amazing CTO. Um, we sort of keep thinking with Alexis how we met that guy. Maybe it was partly accidental, maybe it was godsend, but keep meeting people. And there's no meeting that is sort of, even things like this one today, it's amazing that someone knows someone who's very, very good. And the other thing I would say, which goes against our geriatric sort of side of the team, bet on the young guys. Um, again, for us, the obvious thing was to say we're building an insurance company. Let's go and buy or let's go and sort of hire people who work in the insurance industry. That would have been fatal. If you want to revolutionize an industry, don't hire from that industry. If you want to go against the generation of the 40-year-olds and the 50-year-olds, hire 20-year-olds. For us, if you take us two out of the picture, I think the average age is probably 24 in the company. Really smart, really hungry people. One good thing about the crisis is that you get free loyalty. Um, two, three years ago, maybe five years ago, people would come in and sort of ask for the world because there was a Bank of Cyprus or, a, I don't know, Bank of Greece asking them to go there for a ridiculous amount of money. So you had to go there and convince someone, himself, his parents, his grandparents. One of the first interviews we had was someone we had to speak to her father to allow her to work for us. Nowadays, it's not that of a problem. And also, if, if, you, if you do well as a company and you start sort of um, you know, getting you know, uh, an, a very experienced group of people, this is probably the best time to build that loyalty. So there's some good things about sort of the crisis after all. And the final one is you have to keep innovating. Even in a, in a boring sector like motor insurance, you probably, um, you know, sitting here, you probably think, so what's What's cool about motor insurance? What can you do better? I mean, it's just an insurance thing. You can do a bunch of things. And um, one of the things that Dimitris Zopos was telling us last night, when you're operating in a, in a kind of fucked up place like Greece or any other emerging market, I would put Cyprus in there and put fucked up squared. You have to do, I mean, he used a very American term. Um, we call it vertical integration. Basically, we use the term, you have to, if you want to build a house, you have to go and build the bricks first, and you have to build everything yourself. You cannot trust anyone. So even if it means that you get rid of somebody like JCC or any other sort of sacred cow, you have to do it yourself. Um, you can call it innovation, you can call it whatever you want. It's just basically do everything yourself. You're about to cook a super meal for yourself. Don't buy anything that goes into the microwave. Just do it and do it properly. 
I think one of the huge benefits of conferences like this one is that you meet like-minded people that essentially when you're designing a product or you're coming up with a service, they're the best closed beta, however you want to call it, uh, of an audience to try things out. And I think for us, when we're thinking about, okay, fine, we build a company, we got regulated, we're ready to go and sell, we have our brochures, we have everything, how do you sell to the market? And I think what was important for us to understand was this chart that I'm sure that if you've done any sort of marketing at university, you must have seen before. Um, if you look at the world, and just to give you a brief overview of this, if you break down the consumer groups or the world in general into the innovators and the early adopters, these are the people that typically queue up outside an iPhone, uh, an Apple store in order to get the iPhone, the new iPhone when it comes out. Um, the early adopters are the ones that are saying, fuck that, I'm not going to go the first day, I'm going to wait for a week and get it. Um, but they will get it. The early majority is when you realize that a product has actually reached some sort of market saturation. And that's when you see, you know, people like your parents. Hi, mom. Hi. Um, is when you see them with an iPhone, then you realize that that product has actually reached that early or even late majority. And then you've got a bunch of laggards that will never, ever buy your product, whatever you do. So they're the guys that typically go around still with a Nokia 9185 or whatever it was called, like the guy at the back. Um, but I think from our perspective, the one thing you realize is that if you start appealing to the audience that thinks like you and acts a bit like you, then you will start with the innovators and those are the more receptive to change. Those are the ones that in our case never had a direct contact with a broker, it was typically a phone number that was given to them by the parents. And suddenly if you approach this person, then suddenly you can break that channel. You can start, they're mostly online, they're mostly techie people, they mostly understand the benefit of removing a middleman. They will look at you and say, ah, you're like this company. You, you hear all the time, it's like the Twitter for fashion or it's like the Airbnb for whatever, real estate or something else. And, and I think when people can associate with your business model, it's much easier to break into a market that you're trying to disrupt. And I think from our perspective, that is something that we, um, we realize that in Greece, for some peculiar reason, the innovators are not the 23-year-old that you would expect, but it's actually a 35-year-old, especially in our market. The people that can afford to have cars and the people that can afford to buy the new iPhone and the Mac and the this and the that, those are the people that have money. And the people that have money in Greece right now are probably people that have worked for a few years. So you end up having some statistics that we were shocked to see the first day we got them is that when you look at our client base over the last year, the average age is 43 years old. You would never expect that from a new brand that is entering with a techie kind of way into a traditional industry. But in Greece, everything seems to be 10 years older. So the people that tweet, you look at average stats there, the, we spoke to Facebook, we spoke to Google, we look at their statistics as well. Everybody's just 10 years older than what the typical US or UK or Central European uh, consumer would be. But I think the one piece of, uh, the one learning that we got from this is that it's much easier to start with your own tribe first and then try to get them to be your evangelist. So our first consumers are the ones that are actually going around talking about Elas Direct right now, rather than us spending direct marketing to new people. We keep doing that clearly, but you get a lot of word of mouth coming from your first users who are the innovators by definition. Now we thought we'd share with you, other than three learnings, we'll share with you three um, tough stories that we had to go through, uh, through a fundraising. And I guess um, they, they were from some of our lowest moments, I guess, so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely not spend too much time on them. But I guess Emilius will talk about two of them and I'll speak about the other. I think that, um I think one of the other speakers mentioned earlier that when you do a startup, um, you have to enjoy it and cannot stress that enough. And also, you should be known to your friends, not someone who's going to make a little money, but someone who has amazing stories. If you can achieve that, then it means that you're sort of kind of going somewhere. Now, from our perspective, uh, as Alex said, uh, the, we, we can tell you thousands of stories from uh, uh, Greek bureaucracy or Cypriot bureaucracy, but that's not fun. Um, it, the first story was from, uh, from London when we were uh, looking for money. Uh, we had a meeting with a South African investor. This guy was known across the city of London as one of the toughest people around. Um, he spent 10, 20 years of his life in uh, diamond mines. He had a few people dying under his shift. You know, a very hardcore guy. So um, we walked into his office with Alexis and he looked at us. Like, he said, insurance, right? takes a big baseball ball and just throws it on the wall four times. Just looking at him and then suddenly the door opens and this guy walks in. He's like, uh, this is Chris, he's my actuary, meets Alexis and Emilios. I said, what's going on? Oh, he said, I, I don't shout, I don't ask for help. I have signals. One, 
from my secretary, two is the accountant, three is a lawyer guy, and four is everything else is Chris. So <laughs> it's uh, pointless to say that that meeting didn't go far. Um, but I guess the one of our most characteristic ones, and we keep talking about it with Emilios because it was hilarious. It was um, I think we had already completed about a year being out of a job. Our savings were going through you know empty pockets, and we're at the point where we took an EasyJet flight to go to Tel Aviv on the 24th of December, uh, 2009. Um, Taking an EasyJet flight from London to Tel Aviv is an interesting enough experience on its own, but just to tell you, the reason why we got there is we got a, a random email from one Israeli guy that had heard about us, and he said that, okay, I want to meet you guys. And clearly we were so desperate that we ignored the fact that it was Christmas, we went to be in Cyprus, so we said, okay, fine, we'll, we'll fly over. Um, and actually on our presentation, we had 24th of December, and they realized when we went to the meeting that, yeah, actually these guys came on Christmas Day to present, or the day before Christmas. But um, I don't know if any one of you has actually seen an Orthodox Jewish guy before, but this is what they typically look like. They're wearing a, a big black suit, rubber sole um, shoes, they have big beards and a hat at the top. And they have like, they're, they're very distinct, very different from what we look, let's just put it there. And we went to meet this guy in a lunch place and he said, look, I hope you don't mind, but I eat kosher, so do you mind coming to a specific restaurant that serves kosher, which is the food that you know, Orthodox Jews eat? So he said, sure, no problem. So we decided to go there. So we're walking around and Emilio has the same rucksack that he's got on the first seat over there, which is a pretty big rucksack. And he's had it for many years and he always took it to these meetings. And unlike all the cool kids of the late 90s, Emilio grew up here few years before us, so he usually, usually wears the rucksack on both shoulders. Now you'll understand probably why that's important in the story, because we're walking into this restaurant that we're looking very different to everybody else, and Emilio's has this huge black rucksack um, where he's holding with both hands over here, acting cool. Now thankfully, because I'm shorter, I always walk in front of Emilio, so I could see the guy before they actually stopped us with security, but Emilio's was lifted for about one second from one of the special forces guys that clearly thought he was a suicide bomber. So, you know, we, we were stopped, but clearly that meeting didn't go that well either. But um, Actually, very strong, he, he lifted me, literally. <laughs> like, for a second, I thought that I'm, I'm flying. <laughs> very good. The, the third experience was, uh, this is a word, word of warning to our banks for their when they would be dealing with their new shareholders. They would come from the great state of Russia. They're fantastic people, happy to engage with them, but as shareholders, as investors, they're of a different kind. And especially when you're talking in a distressed situation, um, they are even more different than the way we think. So um, when we started our company, uh, everyone, including our shareholders from London, saying, why don't you buy someone? Why don't you build? Why don't you?" so many bus companies out there, go and buy one. And we kept telling them, you don't want to buy these guys because they're kind of fucked up. That's why they are there. You want to build from scratch. So we build new house, old house, not good. <laughs> and anyway, um, amongst all this confusion, one of our UK shareholders said, there is a company that's about to default in Greece. It belonged to one of the guys who showed you earlier. And there's also a a Russian group that are looking at it. Do you mind going down to Greece to explain to these people uh, whether they should buy it or not? Okay, but you shouldn't buy it anyway. So <laughs> we, we went there. Uh, meeting was in a very sort of secret place in, in, in Athens. This was their local headquarters, big Russian family. Um, we pressed the buzzer, five doors, securities, oligarchs, and so on. So the two of us go there. My rucksack was with me. <laughs> and uh, so we sat there, <laughs> big oligarch comes over, hey, nice to meet you guys, and so on. Well, first we drink, it's seven o'clock, we have whiskey. Okay, um, Alexis, okay, whiskey. So he comes up with a big bottle of Shivas and two glasses. It was like three of us. Thinking like, <laughs> okay, this is why you text your wife, uh, I really love you, I uh, hope I see you again. <laughs> also, please say bye to mom, anyway. So, <laughs> looking at Alexis, Dude, are you going to drink? I said, I don't know, anyway. So, um, he, he said, no, I have my own glass. Okay. So, he brings his glass and goes to Alexis, open the bottle. And maybe this is like a, a big it's a test, I don't know what it is. Uh, and by the way, can we move to the other meeting room? Because we don't want to be close to the windows um, at night. <laughs> okay. So, at that point, it's he started really freaking out, <laughs> thinking, what the fuck? 
But anyway, thank this. God he brought another glass <laughs> and another guy joined us. So it was like, at least there will be more deaths than just the two of us. <laughs> so the but discussion started along the lines, uh, so you work Goldman Sachs, should we buy? We said, no, you don't buy because the guy is not good. No, no, we buy, we give you cars, we keep bank, and guys, again, don't buy because this thing will explode. It's not a good company. Anyway, from seven o'clock, we left the building at like 12, half drunk and so on. We convinced him not to buy, which was <laughs> really good. Two weeks later, the company uh, fell apart. And since then, we're getting Christmas cards from the Russian guy. Thank you for not buying the company. <laughs> so he's a happy guy, although uh, he did not kill us or do anything. Uh, the whiskey was actually pretty good. But um, we'd be delighted to get your questions. I guess the last uh, thought from us is that the most rewarding thing, and we never really experienced it until uh, August last year, is when you actually get unprompted, unsolicited feedback from potential clients. And one, this is one of the most influential bloggers actually in Greece. Um, and we just, you know, at some point in time, a marketing director just runs to us, Marilora, and she goes, guys, guys, check your Facebook, check your Facebook. And this was actually posted on, on our Facebook. So I think the, the bottom line is that, as uh, Dimitrios was saying earlier on this morning, there's a lot of ups, there's a lot of downs. There's, downs are much downer than um, any traditional job. But I guess the one message that we would want to encourage anybody wanting to start their own company is that it is worth it and it's little things like this that really make it worth your while. Thank you.